Great stuff. I might just share my screen straight away. Okay, I think I have my screen shared there. Is everybody seeing me okay? Yeah, good, 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 okay. Um, so first of all, I just want to um, welcome you all to what we're going to call maybe a mini conference, uh, just a short conference in and around the ruralization uh, project. And so the title of our conference today is called Pathways Towards Generation Renewal in farming and in rural areas. And I suppose anybody who uh, regularly join us on the Rural Voices um, seminar series, you'll know that we're feeding out today from this seminar series. And we run the seminar series in conjunction with the Department of Rural and Community Development and the Higher Education Rural Group that um, the Department of Rural and Community Development have established and set up. So this, at the end of every month, we have a seminar series and this month, we decided to present the ruralization work that we've been carrying out over the last three and a half years. So this is for our presentation for today. So I'm just going to maybe give you a small little overview of what we're going to do throughout the next couple of hours and um, maybe then give you an introduction into the ruralization project itself. So I'm going to maybe speak and we're going to have a little bit of, of material presented to you on farm generational renewal. And that is coming from Anne Kensel and Chagas, who is also a partner on our ruralization project. I will speak on another case study that we carried out again in and around generational renewal. New generations in rural areas, Louise Weir and Ashling Marta, who also work on the ruralization project for Galway, are going to speak to you as well. And we're going to do maybe a little bit of some concluding thoughts in and around um, rural policy in the direction we might be presenting or establishing with some results with. Um, finally, um, both myself and Shane Conway are going to give a very, very short insight into two new projects we have coming up in January. So we're going to talk about those towards the end. But maybe just to start with you, I'm going to give you an overview of the ruralization project itself, itself. Maybe just a quick insight into the project. So ruralization project is all about the opening of rural areas to renew rural generations, jobs and farms. And the project itself is a Horizon 2020 project. It was a four year project and funded to the value of over 5 million. We had 18 partners across Europe. Um, in Ireland, as I said, um, ourselves in the National University of Ireland, which is now University of Galway, and uh, Chagas is with us as well. We also had an English partner, which we did quite a lot of work with shared assets and our other partners were spread right across Europe. So maybe just to give you an overview of what we were thinking about when we started to look at this project and we started to write it up initially, we looked very much at this idea that European territorial cohesion is very much threatened by maybe what we could see as an unequal development of the urban and the rural. And you know, 2014 to 2015, 16, what we were seeing very much was populations in urban areas increasing at about double the amount of what was happening in rural areas. And this was quite similar along GDP per head lines, where we were seeing GDP per head about double in urban areas that were in rural areas. We were also seeing access to land, land issues in and around Europe as well. And we were seeing over 50% of the EU land really being controlled by just over 3% of the farms right across Europe. And we were also seeing that nearly 76, nearly 80% of EU's smallest farms were cultivating 11, just over 11% of the EU land. And I suppose when you consider those kind of ideas and thoughts, you can add them in with other issues that were also key in relation to our thinking around this project. And this very much reflects the idea that most farmers are right across the EU are over the age of uh, 55. And few farmers are under the age of 35. And I think this came from Irish media going back a few years ago where it suggested that Ireland has more 90 year old farmers than we have under 30, which is quite a, a stark reality of the older farmer in Ireland at the moment. And 
In two, from 2007 to 2020, the EU had allocated 9.6 billion to aid young farmers and improve competitiveness and generational renewal. So it really, I suppose, I'm not saying it came as a surprise to us as we started to establish this project, but it really was very, very um, important to us that you could see that a lot of this money really didn't seem to have a huge impact on making sure that younger farmers were coming to the fore. And in fact, the court auditors in the EU did suggest that the EU support, this 9.6 billion, is very much based on poorly defined intervention logic, and it would be better targeted to or effective generational renewal. So in and around those kind of ideas, policies really we felt were having little impact on rural areas and they weren't really providing new opportunities to new generations. And as a result, this urbanization was strengthening and rather than a rural kind of perspective. So our idea here was that ruralization would offer a counterforce to urbanization. So what the Ruralization Horizon 2020 project was going to bring to the table, and hopefully we will bring to the table as well, it really aimed to trigger a process of ruralization. And I suppose that is really a development towards a new rural frontier. And in the center of that new rural frontier is really this new generations coming to rural areas and finding economic and social opportunities. And to do this, we analyzed the trends that were there. We made an inventory of rural dream futures of young people. Ashling is going to talk about that shortly. We studied promising practices for enabling rural newcomers, new entrants to farming and farm successors, which myself and, and Anne Kinsler are going to talk about. And we also analyzed rural, rural, I suppose, rules, policies, and actions to provide access to land. And that is also a part of the project that we're not going to present today, but we were involved in as well. So I suppose the outcomes of the project so far, we have discussed with key stakeholders right across the country, and we really are aiming to upscale maybe positive experiences that we found and maybe to jointly formulate new novel ideas for policymakers and also practical tools that rural actors can use. And when you think about all of that, ruralization really is this idea of creating new opportunities for new generations and maybe moving more young people into rural areas rather than them moving out. And again, creating this relative younger population in rural areas, which again would renew the population, create more economic activities, and in turn, again, create this cycle of more opportunities for new generations. So this was our, our major thinking around the ruralization project itself. We had an, an assessment format that we really were involved in within um, the University of Galway. And really, it was a case study model where we looked at the principles or a set of principles of promising practices within case studies. And we looked at these within different regions right across Europe. And we also looked at what was successful, but what also what was not successful. But all of this was underpinned by a conceptual framework. And that conceptual framework, again, we worked at, at this exclusively, I suppose, in the in the beginning of the realization project in Galway itself. And I suppose then we had feed in from all our partners. But three real conceptual frameworks, um, resilience, uh, rural regeneration and capital frameworks really instilled in us this idea of regenerating rural areas. So those were the key concepts that we were looking at within the actual project itself. I'm not going to go too much into them um, as some of those ideas will come through in the presentations as we progress through the afternoon. All of this work was done within eight work packages, um, five of which I have here. So work package three, which myself and Anne will look at, looks at conceptual, um, or which uh, we had looked at in Galway, looked at the conceptual frameworks. The foresight analysis to identify opportunities. Um, again, Ashling is going to look at this very much in and around youth and youth ideas. Rural newcomers and new entrants into farming, Ashling and, and or Anne and myself will look at today. And access to land, as I've said, we're still working on this in work package six, and some of the material is still to come out of this. And similarly with policy contributions, a lot of the material we're still working on at this stage. So I suppose, first of all, I, I, I want to thank you all most sincerely for, for joining you for this afternoon. And I really want to, um, again, thank the Department of Rural and Community Development again for coming on board with the Rural Voices. And I suppose for all of my own team in Galway as well for helping out uh, today on the seminar. 
So I suppose to go back to the agenda and maybe to stop myself sharing here and to go back to the agenda, we're going to start, I suppose, at looking at that idea of generation renewal in relation to rural areas and farms itself. And I'm going to call on Anne Kinsella, first of all, to present um, the work that Anne has carried out in relation to this work package. Okay, thank you, Maura, for that. I just want to make sure I have the... I don't think I have the right slide here. Sorry, just hold on a moment. You're starting at the end yeah. and you're thanking us already. Yes, yeah. Oh, where is it gone to? I think Ashley has yes, it there as well. And yeah, it yeah, it is there. That's it, Jess. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Sorry about that, some technical difficulties. So good afternoon to you all, and thank you for joining us today. And as Maura has outlined there, my uh, presentation title today is Farm Partnerships as a Route to Succession, uh, looking at the learnings and opportunities and from the case studies. And as uh, Maura has already presented some information from the ruralization um, project, um, which Chagas is also a partner in, as, as she mentioned. I'm just going to go straight into work package five, uh, on which all our work on this particular um, aspect is, is based. So looking at work package five uh, on this, the research in which Maura and I are presenting on today, this is informed by initial analysis that was undertaken across the EU on three distinct groups, which were the rural newcomers, the new entrants and the successors in farming. And for each of these groups, 30 case studies were selected throughout the EU on promising practices. And these were undertaken between April 2020 and June 2021. And there was 10 case studies each on rural newcomers, new entrants into farming and farm successors. And it's the farm successors aspect of it that Maura and um, next presentation and this presentation is, is based. And this was executed in 11 countries across the EU. And in the Irish um, case, um, the Irish case studies was in farm partnerships and maximizing organic production systems with a, farm, a focus on farm succession. So looking further at work package five, um, another aspect of this was confrontation activities and promising practices, which um, consisted of in-depth interviews and uh, with regard to the promising practices and 20 were conducted. And these were aimed at sharpening the lessons that were learned in the case studies. And they were undertaken in 12 countries with 20 contexts between July, 2021 and January, 2022. And there was also a comparative analysis report, which we just published earlier in the year, which is a summary of the key findings for each group of the actors as outlined and this um, goes through some of the key learnings emerging looking at the insights on the ruralization process which includes deepening the understanding of the condition and drivers that can support resilient resilience of rural areas and innovation processors that are going on in the rural context so going ahead i'll just look at some of the relevant um literature that is forthcoming from ruralization which is informing this research that we are presenting today so the first report was in 2020 which was looking at analysis of these um three groups um and 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 what was happening across the EU. So this has informed the, the case study selections. In 2021, there was a further uh, publication, and um, this was on the 30 case studies. And on page 824 to 888, if anybody's interested, it's on the Ruralization Project website. This is uh, the information on the farm partnership as a promising practice in the West of Ireland. And the most recent report, which informs this research is the technical report, which was published in 2022, and is the comparative analysis on rural newcomers, new entrants into farming and farm succession. And on page 63 to 83, this outlines some further information on farm successors. So a lot of the presentation today is based on my own research and on these two particular reports as outlined here. 
So without further ado, I'll go straight into the farm partnership aspect of it. And for anybody that may be joining us today that's not very familiar with farm partnerships, I have just a few extra slides just to outline actually what farm partnerships are and, um, and, and how they um, facilitate this um, pathway to succession. So registered farm partnerships are a pathway to succession in that they facilitate uh, it to take place in a more timely and collaborative manner. And Irish farmers can avail of a number of financial incentives and supports which encourage development of these farm partnerships. And a more recent innovation is the Succession Farm Partnership Scheme, which allows young farmers an opportunity to become involved. And these Succession Farm Partnerships provide a structure which two farmers and successors can enter into partnership with appropriate profit sharing agreements. so that the farm is transferred to a successor at the end of a specified. And this has been identified as a promising practice, which further incentivizes a new set of working arrangements between the retiring and the successor farm. So this is just an infographic that has been produced recently on succession farm partnerships, which is the newest innovation under this umbrella of farm partnerships. So if we look at the benefits of these on the right hand side there, we can see that there's a lot of financial benefits with regard to these in that there's a 5000 tax credit. And there's also a defined succession plan and there's financial, social and cap scheme benefits um, benefits include a better work life balance, improved age structure and stock relief, among other items. So in the context of collaborative arrangements and the pathway to succession, we can see here where the registered farm partnerships and the succession farm partnerships fit in, in that if the current uh, farmer and the successor um, are farming together, uh, there's an opportunity to enter into a registered farm partnership um, or a succession farm partnership with the farm um, eventually being handed over to, to the younger farmer. So it's an interim arrangement until the successor uh, begins farming in, in his own right. So um, looking at the next uh, slide here, we're looking at registered farm partnerships as formal legal arrangements. They have been refined and adapted to suit the Irish situation, and they've been identified as a promising practice within the ruralization project. But despite the policies that are in place and the opportunities that they infer, there is still quite low adoption in Irish agriculture in that there's currently just over 3,200 registered farm partnerships in Ireland. And this is a low percentage of our farming population. And there's just over 130 that are the succession farm partnerships. So, however, they're growing steadily. And since the introduction uh, of the um, succession farm partnership, which is, is, is a, a relatively new innovation, so that, that is positive. So if we look at the farm partnerships, um, and the case studies on the farm partnerships as a promising practice that was conducted between April 2020 and June 2021, uh, where there was added complexities during, during COVID so that many of the case studies had to be um, undertaken uh, via the phone. And in, in this uh, regard, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Louise Weir, who we have here with us as well today from the University of Galway, for her valuable assistance in conducting the case study interviews. Uh, which was which was most helpful and uh, thank you Louise uh, Louise for that it's, it's acknowledged and then the focus group on promising practices was undertaken in June 2021 uh, with feedback back sessions um, in June 2021 with the stakeholders, which included the policymakers, and these put the farm partnerships in the policy context with the economic constraints and incentives. So some insights from the respondents um, to the case studies, um, some of these are very insightful and they really sum up a lot of the, 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 the changes that are needed and maybe some of the opportunities that are, that are there. So some one respondent said that we need to talk about succession, that that just doesn't work. Um, and that another respondent said that since they've got into the partnership, there's been a lot of changes and a mindset change. And that has been brought up by a lot of the respondents in this, that it's kind of a stepping stone to this uh, change of mindset mindset and um, in some cases it's subconscious change. Um, in other cases, um, disagreements between um, the farmer and the successor was cited and some maybe said that this was a misunderstanding of values rather than a disagreement. Um, while another said that there was a good balance, uh, putting value in your family in your own time and the whole lifestyle aspect of um, farm partnerships was cited. So 
So um, one of the main findings um, in this research was the issue of financial viability of the farm partnership. This was cited as a crucial aspect by many of the respondents in that if you cannot sustain the farm and provide a reasonable income for those that are involved, it is therefore unlikely to be viewed as a feasible and sustainable option going forward, regardless of its capacity to encourage farm succession to take place. And that's... Um, um, understandable and is key uh, to development of these farm partnerships. There was some wider non-economic benef benefits that could potentially be generated through the farm partnership, uh, which in turn would bring a shift in mindset as either um, farm transfer. And it's especially important in the case of farms who are operating in a system where budgetary constraints are present. And another case study respondent, John, um, summed this up well in that he said that the incentives are really important, but the de design of the incentives is probably the most critical thing. So if we look at the formalized natures of um, registered farm partnership, which have carved a space outside traditional family farming, um, they have enacted changes, including mindset. Um, there's economic benefits, um, including economic viability, the on-farm viability, and also locally, locally in that the economic impact and um, the off-local shopping and the other spin-offs that occur. There's the social aspects um, in that they're on-farming working together. Uh, also the co social cohesion in that partnership farmers themselves and the success are returning to area, area continuing in the farming business. And this wasn't mentioned by a lot of the respondents to the case studies with regard to COVID having actually a positive response in this, that it was further opportunities for um, younger farmers to um, return to the rural area and re work remotely and kind of get a feel for farming with even ones that haven't been involved in the farm before there was an opportunity for them even during the week to get involved in the farming business um another social aspect is to maintain the younger more vibrant rural population through the establishment of these successful farm partnerships and also uh, ruralization and the spin-off social connections that that they infer and culturally, uh, the network and synergies enabled um, would be a kind of culture of saying you can't do it. But then when there's a, a change in um, there's a, a local farmer that gets involved in a partnership and suddenly it brings a change um, in within that area and other farmers start looking at it. So there's a synergy um, within that. And also the awareness working within communities and the remote working opportunities, as I mentioned above. However, the actors do not always hold all the keys and there was no understanding of why things were done. Um, an awful lot of respondents mentioned the red tape and a lot of the paperwork and that every obstacle seems to be put in farmers ways. Um, one mentioned that it was not like when they joined the farm, that it's like everybody is telling you um, what to do and how you can do it so that you have no control over your own farm. So that's uh, came up quite a lot with the respondents and um, the best that they can but it seems to be going backwards instead of going forwards and I think this one sums it up very well in that Ireland we have a funny relationship with the land so I think that sums up a lot of the issues with policies and how we need to change policy um, for the Irish situation. Um, another aspect was land competition and access to land in that farm partnerships were seen to be more between family members and that is the case in Ireland that there are more family partnerships and that this still infers a problem with regard to new entrants to farming that may not have, have land so the whole access to land issue needs to be looked at further. There's also some misconceptions with regard to partnership and land ownership in that a lot had thought that you had to actually transfer over the land ownership initially and that this was not on a phase basis that it is in the, the succession farm partnership so there's a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings there and also the viability of the farm business is, is key and communication breakdown and assumptions is also something that is is, is most important and um, as assumptions and the whole breakdown of communication and um, getting back to the misconceptions and misunderstandings also. So all of, all of that was, uh, was a major issue. So some recommendations that has come from this research is that a more formalized farm partnership arrangements should be encouraged and incentivized more um, to go 
go with a commitment to transfer a lack of understanding there with regard to the difference between registered farm partnerships and loosely formed farm partnerships and the benefits that one infer over the other. Uh, there's some additional tax breaks um, for the retiring farmer was cited by quite a few as something that needs to be looked at to give additional incentive for land access and non-family pensions are quite rare in Ireland so that access to land is still a big issue for new entrants. There's also a scope for a cap type payment for families to engage in succession planning and uh, so to be eligible for a once off payment to cover prescribed hours of legal fees, tax advice, meetings um, with agricultural advisors, um, solicitor, solicitors, uh, accountants and, and others. So some other recommendations. Um, the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine was seen um, by some as the sum of many parts. There was a recommendation there with the departments in relation to implementing various schemes. Another recommendation more of a focus on share farming rather than just land leasing incentives, as this was seen as assisting those farmers already set up. So um, this was so, um, some farmers saw that you know it was just the successors and young farmers that were being looked after and not necessarily farmers that are already set up and maybe are, are, are at a mid mid career stage uh, in their farming career rural broadband and development of the network was seen as an absolute priority um, into rural diversification. So this was something that was, was, was holding many back. Further integration of schemes and policies with less red tape um, was, was another recommendation, the red tape. So startup grants and installation aid for young farmers with the grant levels possibly linked to the region or the farm system. Uh, um, Sorry, Anne. We're just having a few issues then with your broadband. Okay. Sorry, Anne. We just we just had a few little glitches. You're just yeah. coming in and out a little bit there, but keep going and hopefully it'll okay. settle. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Apologies. So um, another thing here was the actors and enabling this innovation. Um, they have cooperated and worked well together, but there is opportunity for further linkages. And with regard to the farms and the rural areas that they operate in, farm enterprise is um, a more regionalized and adapted policy should be looked at. And in relation to the registered farm partnerships, which are built on a solid foundation already with the farmer to the forefront and the actors working towards a common goal, but responding to the multiple needs of different farmers at different locations and in different farms. So this research is ongoing and multiple bodies have already been involved and they're working extremely well together as it has been acknowledged in the case study. So we need to build on that. A best practice guide has been developed on registered farm partnerships, but yet there's some misinformation and misconceptions, some scepticism, as, as one uh, respondent referred to it as. The database on registered farm partnership is available, and this coupled with in-depth research already carried out provides further opportunities for more innovations in this um, space so that we can utilize that and see where the holes are and where the lost opportunities are. So innovation and succession seems to be key. It seems to go hand in hand. And the importance of networks um, and facilitating knowledge exchange, specifically through discussion groups for you, very important. Support and policies which more broadly support agricultural and rural policy um, areas and support frameworks is also key. The characteristics of the farm itself is crucial in facilitating succession, to facilitate from the inside out, to start with the farm itself and the viability and the sustainability of the farm is, is, is so, so important. And of most important is the economic resilience. The process of change is also as of a farm succession and 
how the process can be improved and external supports to bring up the topic, starting with that conversation as it was often referred to. But farm partnerships have been good at starting that conversation. Um, linked also are the legal requirements and the expertise of different experts and actors. However, an identification of a successor on the smaller, less viable farms is problematic and it is a limiting factor of farm partnerships. And in the West, of Ireland, the predominance of an army. Um, needs to be accommodated during the farm business model somehow. Um, part time working on the farm and acts as a stepping stone. And registered farm partnership are an innovative report, report, approach to collect. organizational innovation is also the most important aspect of these. They harness the opportunities on farm at a time of change and when, when a young farmer is taking. Still having a few issues and with your broadband, you seem to be coming in and out a good bit. So. Over the farm and the incentive type of working arrangements, which create now, so apologies. Yeah, and I think we might draw a conclusion on yours there, if that's okay. And we've quite a, we have a no, number of questions as well. Or even Anne, if you turned off your video for the last second, it might just um, it might just assist. But I think if you were nearly finished, we might maybe continue on, and we can have some questions for you afterwards. Can you hear me again? Can you hear me? Okay. 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 No, well, that's okay, Maura. That's fine. I was that's just on perfect. the last slide anyhow, so apologies. No, 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 and that's fine. Apologies. And we already have a few questions coming in, so we might go to the questions after I have presented as well, if that's okay with everybody. So I suppose just to, to thank Anne straight away and, and just to kind of say that this element of the conference that we're looking at here at the moment is very much in and around generational renewal, getting those new people into um, rural areas, getting young people in, um, getting successors on farms in. So I think that's our, our concentration. And Anne's ideas in and around farm partnership really was an excellent um, example of how this can be done within um, the agricultural realm, especially. So I suppose just kind of considering again that idea of innovation and generation renewal um, within the case study that we carried out in Galway again, we looked at organics and we looked at this idea of where are the pathways for generation renewal using this example maybe of Irish organic um, agriculture. So again, I suppose our idea here for this part of the project was really that we would again try and move away from that negative spiral of rural decline and really look towards a, spa, a, a positive spiral of um, new rural opportunities for new generations. And in doing that, um, this case study for us was a great example of how not just, I suppose, succession can be um, examined or looked at, but also how new newcomers into rural areas and new entrants into farming and people also can access land. So organics we felt was a very good opportunity as far as to look at ruralization and all of those aspects of generation renewal. And within that then, I suppose our, far, our focus initially was farm viability and Anne has mentioned this as well as a key aspect of generational renewal and aspects of succession and how I suppose that conversation on farms is being had in and around the farm viability. And is it even viable to hand on these farms? So we looked at farm viability in relation to generation renewal and then we looked at innovation practices through organics. So I suppose just very quickly in setting the scene here, a lot of us will be quite conscious of the fact that agriculture has changed dramatically over the last number of years. And there's really been a radical overhaul of the agricultural industry. And I suppose from an academic perspective, we're often talking about this idea of moving very quickly away from those kind of very strong productivist kind of ideas to this idea of multifunctionality where on a farm, on any Irish farm, on any given day, there's a multiple idea of practices going on. So people could be involved in production, but they also could be involved in many, many environmental aspects to farming as well. 
But as a result of this agricultural change, what we've seen in agriculture is we've, we've seen a decline and a changing structure of the family farm, particularly the age demographic that I mentioned on the very opening session of the conference. And you also see that we have considerable issues of succession and inheritance that Anne spoke about earlier on. We have environmental concerns, food security today, which has never been more prevalent for all of us. And um, we also see changing innovative practices. We see younger farmers wanting to bring in innovative practices and how successful or non-successful they are at being able to do that. And I suppose when we looked at this idea, first of all, of generation renewal, and again, this idea of innovation and organics on farms, I suppose in looking at farm succession as a conceptual thinking of how we were to pitch this idea, I suppose, again, we looked very strongly at Shane Conway's own work, who has spent quite a number of years at this stage in and around farm succession. And we also looked at the work of Matt Lobley, amongst many, many others. So again, in seeing this and in reading this literature, it becomes very obvious that there's an older age group of farmers there. And they're either reluctant to hand over the farm for a viability reason, as Anne said earlier on, that there is huge viability reasons in and around some of the smaller farms right across Ireland and right across Europe. But there's also, as Shane would have identified in his research, there's this emotional attachment to agriculture and farming in Ireland and again across Europe that really makes it very reluctant for the older farmer to hand over the farm. And all of this reluctance farm succession type of thinking and issues really impact not just on the young farmers, but it also impacts on new entrants into farming. And it also impacts on our access to land for people who may be wanting to get into farming outside of our traditional handover of farm. It also impacts on innovation practices on farms and the viability of the farms. So I suppose who is the su this successor that we keep talking about? The successor within an Irish context is often a family member, it's a sibling, or maybe on a lesser case, a relative. Um, it's very not as often a non-farm family member. It can be a delayed successor, somebody who moves away for a while and comes back. It could be a successor that's trying to diversify the farm as well. The wider traits that we would have found, and it's also there in the literature, is this successor is somebody who is often educated and well-educated. They can be of varied ages, they can be innovative, they can be community involved. They can combine new and traditional knowledge, I suppose, with the care of the environment. So it was interesting for, for us within this project to identify this successor and their traits right from the get go. And I suppose we also looked at this idea of knowledge networks and innovation and how important they were to this idea of generation renewal. So we looked at network knowledge transfer. And we've seen from the very start that family networks are hugely important when we're talking about generation renewal. And the transfer of knowledge, I suppose, within the farm family, it happens prior to succession at all. It's there right from the word go, right from the family member getting involved in the farm. But we also found in line with this family networking and knowledge transfer, there was peer to peer learning as well that impacts on generational renewal. And this can be formal, it can be informal, it can be very much training that happens in the country, training that happens at, at education level, or I suppose within the likes of Chagas. And this peer-to-peer -peer learning, what we did find was that it consolidates the learning and it raises the bar in relation to generating innovation and ideas and practices. And we, all, we also looked at innovation theory, I suppose, to kind of I suppose, consider our thoughts. And what we did find was that we we're very much moving away from this linear path of transferring knowledge. And that there's a diversity of innovation now between systems, networks, supply chains, everything. So it's not just a family idea of innovation. And we also found this idea of novelty production, that novelty thinking, thinking outside the box at the moment seems to be, again, part of innovation and it's also becoming hugely part of generation renewal. So I suppose the, the importance of collective learning, both local and extra local sources became hugely important within our research and within our thinking in and around this area. 
And this led us quite definitely to organic farming and the opportunity for farm viability within organic farming. And what we did see was that organic farming is much more successful and much more prevalent right across the EU than it is in Ireland. So the land under organics it has increased by about 500,000 hectares on an annual basis. And there's over 13.8 million areas of, of usage of land agriculture covered in organics at the moment in Europe. But organics in Ireland is not as popular as we have found it to be across Europe. But that is changing, and I think it's changing somewhat because of the policy changes that we've seen. The organic farming um, scheme has given 56 million in the last um, common agricultural policy. There was area-based payments. There was organic capital investments. So I suppose it has led us to an increased land capability in and around organics. And I just found this PC, even in the Farmer's Journal over the last couple of weeks, this idea that we are significantly increasing people involved in organics. And it was a piece that came from the Chagas Signpost program. And I suppose our concentration within this research, then we, we hit on this MOPS program, that is a program via the EIP Agri European Innovation for Partnership for Agriculture project. And it's maximizing organic production um, systems. And really this case study was there where we wanted to examine young farmers, new entrants into farming, succession, farm viability, and then organics. So we carried this work out from June to October in 2020. It was very much desk-based initially, and then we produced a three-pronged approach. And in that three-pronged approach, we carried out a number of in-depth interviews with the MOPS group themselves, but also additional organic farmers. We then carried out focus groups and then we carried out feedback sessions where we also learned what the people found out about key stakeholders, found out about what we found ourselves. We had quite a gender balance. And again, similar to Anne, because of COVID was online and the interviews were, because of COVID, the interviews were held online. Just a little bit on the MOPS project that we concentrated quite strongly on. Again, this was an organics um, project that was funded via the European Innovation Partnerships for Agriculture. There's 11 farmers involved in this and it has three regions right across Ireland. And initially this group came together really by looking for more information or more advice via an agronomist. And the, I suppose coming together in this group it really raised a question for the group about partnership approaches and about networking and how this group could network. And in thinking about that, this group came together via the Irish Organics Association researchers, and they created this multi-actor approach, which allowed them, I suppose, be funded via the EIP Agri scenario. So I suppose when we look at the map of Ireland, you can see where the 11 um, organic farmers are spread right across the number of nuts three regions in the east and the west and the south of Ireland. And they're also across a number of Irish counties as well, Kilkenny, Cork, Galway, Leash, Wicklow, Kildare and Wexford. And in looking at this, I think our results led us to think very, very strongly about farm viability. Um, the MOPS, the core focus of the MOPS project really was to optimize organic horticulture. And it created a collaborative cropping system among the full group themselves. And they did this by looking at the retail demand that was out there and responding to that growing demand. And in doing that, they developed a short supply chain, which really facilitated, I suppose, what was profitable and what was innovative. Innovative. So we had one uh, interviewee suggesting that more important than profitability, that we would actually have a demand for the crops and that they were able to do what suited their farm, what suited their skill set and what suited they had on their own farm. And we were also seeing that innovation was becoming a huge part of the MOPS group. As one interviewee suggested, I launched a veg box scheme in 2019, literally just one night decided to set up an Instagram page, Facebook page, and after about a week, they were booked solid. So that kind of innovative practices were really driven through the MOPS project itself. And I suppose that kind of positive project results really epitomized what was also there in the research itself, which shows you that there is a financial viability in and around some organic farms at the moment, possibly more so than some conventional farms. And I think that idea of farm viability was really played out as the MOPS group themselves, as they published their report in 2021, which really showed the trade, purchasing and selling of organic horticulture 
fresh produce between the MOPS project growers, it increased by 62% year over year by the final year of the project. So it was quite stunning, the results of the growers report via the MOPS project. And it brought this group of total, their total sales turnover, it brought them from over 3 million in 2017 via this collective system of selling to just about 8 million in total within the three years. So it was quite successful in relation to the viability of the actual farms that were involved in the MOPS project. What we also found in that idea of networking knowledge and innovation, we found that knowledge development was really key to the MOPS project, but also the other organic farmers that we spoke to over and above the MOPS group. But the MOPS participants, they really worked and networked with a qualified uh, number of people over the three years. And this really created this multi-actor approach within the group themselves. And because of that, there was a huge amount of peer-to-peer -peer learning. And there was a huge value placed on this collaborative and network kind of thinking. As one interviewee suggested, I suppose the good thing about MOPS as much as anything else is that we have constant advice and we also have the kind of teamwork. I wouldn't say it's teamwork and that we're all exactly on the same thin sheet, but yet there is a consultation and a talking process that really assisted the MOPS group. So the MOPS project and advisors, they've been really good for evaluating which crop works best for us. So I think that collective peer-to-peer -peer learning was hugely important in relation to innovative ideas and knowledge transfer. Everyday innovations were also something that we identified via the project. And I suppose innovation approaches and the transferability of ideas and innovations, this was really central to the MOPS farmers and organic farmers in general. They were, they were very forthcoming with what actually works for them. And innovation within MOPS, they also told us that it's not always purely scientific. And it was quite noteworthy for us that social innovations were also something that really worked for these group of farmers. And as one interviewee suggested, I suppose the innovations doesn't always have to be highly scientific stuff. I'd say the innovation wasn't what we expected. The innovation has actually come from just doing good records. WhatsApp groups were also suggested as something that really can be quite innovative among a group of people themselves. And another person via the focus group suggested that it's about this innovative of organic farmers and even the collective innovation, the different synergies that are there between this. And they really felt that this could entice new younger farmers to join this organic movement. Intergenerational knowledge transfer was also we found what we found within organic farmers themselves and the MOPS groups in particular, and they were really interested in enhancing succession. And I suppose they placed real value, not just on young farmers coming in, but they also faced placed huge value on the older farmers and they placed huge value on the older farmers as a very valuable source of tactic and lay knowledge. So they really acknowledge the ambition of young farmers and new entrants, and they really try to nourish this rather than to dismiss it in any way. So the MOPS project facilitated a level of communication with new entrants in a very practical and worthwhile way. And some farmers, some interviewees also suggested that the knowledge that's there among the older farmers is hugely valuable. We also found that the, the returning successor was also something that was quite valuable within the organics industry. So it really enhanced succession practices. Now, as we all know, intergenerational succession and inheritance within Ireland is really the only way that a majority of people can get access to land in Ireland. And this is much the same for organics as well. They really do follow, have to follow that traditional inheritance ideology. What we also found, however, we did find that people involved in organics, there was often this professional detour attached to their career. So there was often this idea that they moved away, they found, um, I suppose, ideas and practices while they moved abroad. And this resulted in new entrants being more inclined to try organics, but it also gave us this idea in the results of the project that there was infusion of, blue, of new blood in organics, not just young blood, but new blood taking over organic farming. So there was potential innovators and new entrepreneurs coming into farming. And I suppose, as the interviewee um, suggested here in both of these, there was huge experiences and knowledge gained by people traveling abroad and finding experiences abroad and bringing this back to the farm and then setting up organic farming. 
So I suppose in conclusion, just to draw some parameters around what we did find, we did find quite a positivity around organic farming. That's not to say that every organic farm in Ireland outside of maybe the MOX group at the moment is successful where we didn't exactly find that. But we did find that there is a positivity at the moment in and around organic farming and particularly in relation to the MOPS group, that the fact that there was an enhanced and increased farm viability. The opportunities, I suppose, we also found are not only in the development trajectory of existing organic producers, but importantly, organic farming can act, I suppose, as a catalyst to attracting new farmers and successors. And the MOPS case study really is a model for greater viability and sustainability. Transferability is also something that we found within this project. It was very easily transfer this model of success. It also provided a pathway for succession, the returning successor and the new entrant. We also found that group cooperation for farm viability was also something that was hugely important, as is supply chain innovations. So I suppose we also have produced this in a paper at the moment, and we've published this via the Journal of Sustainability. So I suppose anybody who wants any more information in relation to this, you are welcome to um, read this paper that we have published at this stage. So I suppose, thank you um, for that. That was our little whistle stop tour, maybe of generational renewal for both myself and Anne who looked at this area. So. Maybe we might open it up maybe to some questions at this stage. I think there's some questions coming in in the chat already. Maura, would you like your questions or will we pop back to Anne first? Yeah, maybe we can pop back to Anne if Anne is there. Okay. Anne, are you still with us? I can't hear you, Anne. Yes, I won't turn on my um, video. Just yeah, that's perfect. Of you, being you, might have had a, you might have had a chance to look at them, man. I think they're all themed around the same thing in relation to the size, the size of farm, the farm partnerships. And what can is there a difference? You did mention it or tried to mention in the difference of the size that take up the farm partnerships. It might be more biased toward the larger ones. And what do you think could be done to incentivize the smaller farms? And there's also a question there around the tax. Is there anything that could be done to offset when it becomes to inheritance? If the, it's, it's mainly dairy farms that enter these. And you know what? I don't think that's going to work for us, Anne. Would you be able to maybe put in your answers into the chat to those questions, Anne? Would that be a good idea? Farm partnerships and my colleagues, Gordon Peppard and Donnelly. Sorry, Anne, we're not picking you up very well yeah. there. So we might get you just to, to feed in via the chat, mm -hmm. Anne, if that's OK. Thank you, Anne. Um, Maura, we'll pop back to your ones. Um, you have very good questions as well. You mentioned a culture change. and there, Francis mentioned how that's very interesting and probably something that might just kickstart something. But the big question is, have you any suggestions as to how we might move that culture change forward? Yeah, I suppose it is in relation to organics. I think sometimes a culture change can happen when we see enhanced viability in relation to a particular area, but there are huge difficulties and we're, nobody is saying that it's easy move into organic farming. There are difficulties. Now I do, I would suggest that the new common agricultural policy is really, um, it, it, it's this hand, enhanced ideas in and around organics within that project or within the, the the CAP strategic plan coming out. So I think it will be easier, I think, to get funding, easier to, I suppose, look towards organic farming as a possibility. The other thing I would also think, looking at our research in relation to the MOPS project and other organics, I think a lot of the MOPS um, individuals were org already organic farmers, but I think what became new and interesting via the MOPS project was the supply chain that they created among themselves and also that collaboration that they had, which really enhanced innovation. So I think if anything is going to work, I think it's this idea of collaborating with other people for networking with other people like-minded people that are already involved in this and I suppose not to see these people as competitors but to see them as people that really can enhance your viability and your ideas your innovation and your business. You have another one more from Brendan who suggests that using the three pathways is essential to get people involved 
but a query as to whether maybe organic farmers will stay the long haul, the difficult road to furrow perhaps. And I wonder, is it easy at this stage to be able to tell as to whether there's a dropout level as the years progress? Um, I wouldn't have any in, uh, full mm. information in relation to a dropout level, but I suppose what we were looking at specifically was trying to get new generations into organic farming. That's what we would have been looking at. And I think what we did see was this return um, successor, this idea of the younger people are definitely more interested within the organic farming. And what we also found was that organic farmers seem to instill this idea and the importance of the environment and organics at a very young age within the family circle. And that really enhanced the possibility of younger farmers taking over within organics. And I think that's kind of what we found there. And um, the longevity of it happening, I think again, we'd have to look towards policy environment and suggesting that maybe over the long term, um, organic farming is something that's increasingly going to be funded within the Irish context, as it has been for many years right across Europe. And as we have seen, it's much more successful in Europe than it is in Ireland. But I do think as time goes on, I think the longevity of funding will continue in relation to organics because it takes quite a lot of boxes for us in relation to the environment, climate action and sustainability. I'll ask you one more, Maura, two in one, they're kind of both related before we move on to the next presentation. Do you think that the farms have to be a certain size to be economically viable for the organic farming and kind of linked to that more considering the current crisis economically, food crisis, war, etc., that it might impact people's preference for organic supplies, the demand for it? Yeah, I, I think so. Of course, price is always an issue and there's always this idea of price within organics. But I think, again, the MOPS project really showed how um, they really looked at and explored particular um, produce, how much money that produce was making, how much uh, the demand for that produce as well. So I thought that was a very interesting aspect of their, pro of their um, project. And they really tailored their their produce and the development and the growing of their produce to a demand led kind of an idea. And I, I suppose, um, again, uh, the size of farms, we uh, funnily enough, um, this is one of the areas that is most interesting when it comes to organics. I do know within Galway, there's an organic farm um, that is quite a small, we did a, a case study on it ourselves in Galway over the last number of years. And I think they have something like they initially started off with about 20 acres and they added another 10 acres to this farm. And I think at the moment on a seasonal basis, they hire about 20 to 25 people to create the box organics and um, food produce that they actually have. So I think the success of the farm, organic farm, sometimes is not mm -hmm. really the size of the farm itself. It's often how productive you're doing, the networks that you've created and the demand for the particular produce you're, you're, you're um, producing. But again, in saying that, um, we're, we're not definitely saying here in the University of Galway that we're experts in relation to organics. We really just have researched the people who are mm -hmm. absolute experts out on the field, but we did really enjoy looking at the process, mm -hmm. the networks and how we can enhance generational renewal. Brilliant. Thank you, Maura. We might move quickly on to the next one. Great. Um, so I suppose we're moving again. We're still staying in that area of um, young people, generational renewal. And what we're going to do now is we're going to look at new generations in rural areas. And we're going to start off with Louise herself, who has been so kind to ask these <laughs> questions. So Louise is going to look at this idea of a case study in and around remote working. So I'm going to call on Louise now to share her um, Thank case you, study. Okay, can everybody see the screen okay? Well, I can see it. Okay, I hope you can all see it. Um, I was going to start this presentation and say this all proves about remote working, but then Anne's connection had to go and kind of under, undid that approach. But maybe I can put that into the policy at the end where we need more better infrastructure. So like Anne and more, I was part of Work Package 5. Um, when we looked at promising practices and I was looking at the newcomers, so I won't go through the methodology as they've already covered it. The focus for today, and we're all very aware of what's happening with remote work across Ireland, Europe, globally at this stage. Um, but today for the focus, instead of going over all of what we know, we're going to look at the remote workers and how can we keep those within our rural areas to regenerate them. So 
In line with that, I'm going to unpack the concept of resilience and use it as a lens to extract policy implications for rural regeneration. For this project, as Maura said to you, rural regeneration is the key aspect to it, but we want it to be transformative so that we have something different moving forward, new pathways that can transform our rural society to ruralization as a counterbalance to urbanization. And within that, we looked at this concept of resilience. How can resilience help us to move forward? Within resilience, it relates to ideas of adaptability and transformation. To be resilient, you need to be able to adapt, identify, but also bounce forward. It isn't just returning to the normal state. We chose remote work as a case study because in fact, we chose it before COVID, believe it or not, um, as it had that promising potential to align to a number of object objectives across different policy areas and also quality of life, which we all seem now to be moving into well-being and happiness and state sustainability. And it just held that promise of this idea of create a new sustainable development pathway. So the approach I've taken is similar to other st studies, one like Steiners and Atherton, where you look at the actual agent, the newcomers themselves, and how they, where do they get involved with resilience? Rather than the outcome, we're going to look at the process. But a newcomer, of course, is always a stumbling block when you start these things. How do you define a newcomer? Well, on the right hand side of my screen, anyway, you can see that there are numerous ways to identify it. It could be a farmer coming into the land, entrepreneurs, labour migrant, international, national, rural to rural. There are numerous and a plethora of definitions that we could use for this. But for our project, we left it quite open to see what we would find because it was at that early stages. And a newcomer is a person to migrate from another area towards rural area, but who may work outside agriculture or forestry. So we were looking beyond agriculture as well, because our rural areas are a diverse area. Resilience. We're all resilient, I think, after COVID, or we're supposed to be. And that's the word that is on every newspaper, every politician is using it, and we in academia are also using it and at different policy levels. It's in academia, it's at international level, our national reports are coming out, our own national policy is littered with the word resilient. So we have to ask ourselves, we're signing up to this. Is it a buzzword or is it actually a useful concept? And if it is useful, then that helps us to dig into our research that we have found these different results to say, how do we target policy at areas where it'll actually make a difference? So that's what I do with this presentation. We're going to use resilience to see if we can actually identify where we could make operational policies. Like all good concepts, resilience also has history and has evolved over time. Um, and has a tome of information behind it. But essentially when Scott looked at this in 2013, he identified two approaches that you could identify from the way resilience can be used. One sees it um, as looking a bounce back. It's as a shock, you have to respond to it. For example, COVID that we've just experienced. But the bounce back is just to retain the state that you were before. Whereas a new approach is to identify resilience as something saying, well, we like some of what we had before, but we're going to make it better. We're going to transform. We create a pathway for moving forward, new pathways. And considering the environment we are in within transition environment, we need to be able to bounce forward. So it's an emphasis on transformation and new path creations. When we get to that stage, then we can start looking at paths. And we say, well, what enables paths? And it brings in the concept brings in this idea of path dependencies. And we see that in a few minutes. The other thing about resilience is not just these massive shocks. It allows us to look at slow burning processes like the population decline. It doesn't have to be a war or a pandemic. So resilience is very useful. Some argue that it's being supplementing and take out sustainability. For us, we feel resilience is a condition for sustainability. We're viewing it more of a process than an outcome. It also lets us identify what are the attributes of an area? What are the attributes of a person, individual, community, or place. And once we identify that, we can then see maybe what is missing or what is used to make it work. It's an adaptive cycle that was put together, um, the source from Pendle et al, and it sees that you have four stages in this idea of resilience. The reorientation or organization phase is strongly linked with the concept of regeneration, because it's in those phases where we have innovation and learning takes place. So you can see in the top right conservation state, this is where you have everything you've moved through. It's almost like moving out post COVID. It's stable. The pathway is in place. 
but you have low resilience because you're not adapting right now. You're just in a, a state of, um, I suppose, a static state. If a shock occurs and you're in a release phase, it's you're going to adapt. And when you're moving from the bottom right to the top left hand corner, that's where all the innovation happens. Now, resilience is high there because you have to be able to adapt very quickly. You're forced to learn, you're forced to innovate, and it comes back down again. And at each stage, it's decreasing in resilience. If we throw in our newcomer in here, our new our remote, my screen is just going a bit funny on me. Rural communities and the resilience can look to the presence of how they interact with the resources within the community. And those resources can be economic, social, and environmental resources. So we had to look, did the newcomers add any value to the area? So in terms of economic, yes, they are diversified the economic sector, they bring in different jobs. And one respondent said, well, their job isn't there, their money is, so they can buy a coffee when they bring their children to school or they're going to the local shops. They create demand for new services via critical mass. They also have a function of place promotion. So they're letting others know about remote work and this is a good place to live, you can do it from here. And training opportunities have developed because of it. Our study showed that they were environmentally conscious and aware. There was an appreciation and a motivation to protect with some getting involved with renewable energy within the communities. Social and cultural, increased population, huge community engagement across different groups, swimming groups, um, there were local chapter groups that grow remote through the social enterprises, and a lot were getting added connections through family and friends, generating that social capital within the community. So we can see that the newcomer is adding capacity and adding capital to the rural area. Oh, there we are. So how much value are they adding? And where are they adding it? What do they do to the receiving community? Well, newcomers not only contribute to rural capitals, but they can stimulate to spiral up. And this is where we link to resilience. This is how we can start this transformation from that static state. If you can build the supports for local services, then you're building up the capacities for critical mass and the community, you're tapping into existing social capital. And as that moves up the scale, you can add to the existing stock or the capitals within that community. So we're moving up, we're, we're building, we're creating those new pathways. But then we have to ask, is this resilient? Is this what resilience looks like? Yes, we have all the evidence. We're all working from home. Uh, we are more time to give to the community. But is that what the resilience concept said it is? When we had our focus groups and our interviews, a lot of them highlighted particular barriers that may actually re prevent this pathway from developing. There's a shortage of housing, restrictive planning policies, lack of services and weak governance. When we use it and test that against the concept, it points to this idea of system maintenance, where we might actually get locked into a path dependency. We're going to have a different development path, remote work, but it's still going to be hindered by these issues with one author suggesting for local government had no jurisdiction or fund investments to support the new pathways, no significant changes were made to path dependence. So you're just back into the same vicious circle. So I just popped this on to apply this into our, the cycle I showed you a minute ago. We had COVID act as a trigger and it caused this change and it moved from the bottom right to the top left, that's sort of the innovation, mass lockdown, remote work movement, we're all working from home, we adjusted, we trained, we upskilled, we're within our communities, but we're all settling back and moving into a more conservative stage. So when we're in that stage, unless we make changes at policy level, we're just going to go around in circles. We won't build, that innovation won't continue to stimulate into new stocks. So how do we maintain this conservation stage? But we like the high resilience at the lockdown remote stage, so the mismatch is here. This is where we need policy now. We dig in, we see this is actually what we want, high resilience. And at that stage, you see underlined, I have innovation. So what do we need to do? We need to focus on the process of resilience rather than the outcome. Let's ask ourselves, what was up in the top left hand corner? What were those drivers in that state of high resilience? When we look at new recoveries, it was connections, innovations, and learning. When you try and identify, where did that happen for our newcomers within the community? Where did innovation take place? It was within the networks within the community. 
formal and informal networks. That's how emerged the spaces where these processes took place. And in there, there was learning and innovation was evident and their active catalyst for capacity development. These networks allow actors to mobilize ideas and resources and support others' context to benefit the rural region. Mitchell and Shannon Reiser created this idea of creating a path dependency model. And I inserted our results into this to see where we at, what's the potential of this becoming a new development pathway. The rural system in the first and exhaustion, declining population, the typical services. We moved into a path emergence, the fourth phase of Mitchell and Shan's one, because we had a new, totally new emerging one. But we still have this disconnected policy arrangements, which is undermining that creation of a new pathway. But there are still signals for it. We have interdependence between rural and urban, we've new policy and legislation, and we've translocal. So we're not too far away from it. So the mechanisms that we need to work on, where can policy target? It needs to target legislation framework, to target to ensure that these become resilient, integrate remote working into other policy areas. We have to work on capacity development. And that isn't just upskilling the individual or the community. That is also at policy level. Do they have the skills and the awareness and the knowledge of what's required and the organization framework to implement good policy? We need to work on place making terms of connected policy and investment strategies and coordinated service delivery. Just a few wider things. This presentation obviously is just around the positive side effects and said nothing about the receiving area or the agencies or the governments involved in remote working. That's a whole other conversation. And there is always more than one pathway to rural regeneration. This is one potential one with a lot of potential evidence. When we talk about resilience, we'd still have to ask ourselves who's responsible for building resilience and who's resilience and for who, who has the agency to make those decisions. When we talk about capitals and social stock, we have to think about territorial cohesion. What type of newcomers are coming back in? Are they young? What age? Are they a particular pathway in their career? What are the resources within different places? They are all different, as we know, the diversity of rural areas. And again, we have to look at remote working for female participation in economic resilience. We know that they're very useful in social resilience and social fabric, but what's the paid role for that? What it might mean is that we need a lot of different infrastructural needs at different levels for different communities. I rushed through all that, but I think we're doing okay, Maura. Thank you. Great, Louise. Thanks a million. Some really, really good ideas coming out of that aspect of the work as well. Um, so I think before we ask any questions, I, I'm going to call on Ashling Murta, who is, I suppose, the lead postdoctoral researcher in relation to the ruralization project. And Ashling again is going to look at this idea of new generations in rural areas. And she's going to concentrate really on this youth aspect of the project, which was uh, a really interesting aspect of the project for us here in Ireland. And uh, I'll let Ashling tell you a little bit more about that. Thanks, Maura. Um, so I, I'm going to kind of jump into another work package of ruralization, which was kind of a, a future foresight exercise. And part of this involved um, looking at um, young people and basically what they dream for in the future and where they would like to live. Um, and I'm also going to, similar to Louise's approach, look at kind of resilience and how we can uh, tie resilience and draw some kind of deeper conclusions for policy out. Um, and this is very much a group exercise um, between myself, Moore and Louise, and working all on this. And to mention um, Thomas Kimonen as well, who kind of was the lead researcher within the ruralization project, um, who kind of spearheaded all the methods that we're using here. And he's based in the Finland Futures Research Centre. Um, so I kind of cover three key areas um, I kind of br very briefly talk about why would we use a, a, a foresight approach to examine youth issues and generational renewal. I'll give you a kind of a brief whistle stop tour of the European level research and what we found in Ireland, which is kind of an ongoing piece of work. Um, and then we'll um, touch on some of the policy implications and how we can realise some of these dreams. 
So why take a futures research approach? Um, well, there's a lot of research out there already on kind of why young people leave rural areas. And I suppose two key um, issues that emerge very frequently are the opportunities around education and jobs and um, that young people need to kind of get out of rural areas to realise their ambitions, to, to access particular jobs and build their skills that there is potential then that maybe they won't come back, they develop social connections in other areas. And also that potentially maybe the opportunities that, that exist in other areas have, have higher salaries than the rural opportunities. So there's a lot of barriers there. So we're kind of flipping the question a little bit with the, the foresight approach. And um, so we're kind of asking the question of why, how can we, how can we encourage these young people to stay or return? And there is research out there that is pointing to the fact that young people do want to live rural lives, but there are a lot of kind of barriers um, in the way. And there's, I suppose, a wider recognition as well that foresight studies have great importance in rural policy, bodies like the OECD pointing this out. And it's also a kind of creative particip participatory research method that's perhaps more interesting for participants to be involved in and, and um, generates uh, deeper and uh, more insightful results. Um, so what we did in terms of this youth futures research, so basically we kind of asked young people to look, it was 15 years ahead at the time that data was collected in 2020, where um, they would like to live. And we also asked where they were where they were born, where they currently live and where they would like to live in the future, but also breaking this down into kind of six key areas. So we had different types of urban areas and different types of rural areas, as you'll see there. Um, we also asked kind of three key areas of the kind of this recipe for their dreams. What's their livelihood, their, their, their dream job and um, the lifestyles of how they live and also the kind of accommodation community aspects um, of this dream. And crucially, what are the obstacles that they saw in realising this? Um, the European level, this research was done in, in 10 countries, and there are two kind of key reports that draw together all of the European findings that you'll, you'll find on the ruralization website. Um, there's a lot of information there, but kind of the key findings at the European level well analysed. So what we're kind of trying to do now is to look at the Irish data and see what's distinctive about it, what's, what are the key areas for us in Ireland that we need to reflect on for policy. And it is quite, I suppose, a small sample. We did aim to, ha to have about 200 participants in each of the countries. So we, we did achieve that. Um, but still, it's not, a, I suppose, a representative sample. But there's interesting illustrative patterns there on the content of these dreams. In terms of the, the age group we targeted is 18 to 30. We did hope um, to do workshops around this, but because of COVID, it was administered online. We focus on two regions, Western and Eastern region of Ireland to have some diversity. And we also brought this forward um, to another step it, with stakeholder workshops. So once we gather the dreams of the youth, and um, we asked people who maybe held the cards of realizing some of this and how they would kind of propose um, some of these uh, dreams could be realized. And we're now in a final step of this research where we're doing a kind of second round of stakeholder interviews to understand this how question of realizing the dreams and how these new policy proposals um, might be constructed and realized. And so essentially what we found in Ireland was that Ireland's youth do dream of a rural future. Um, and this is just to give you an idea of the sample, like we do have a, I suppose, a higher proportion of the 18 to 24 year olds, more females, more students. So we have to bear this uh, in mind as we analyze our results, but it does show us the interest that exists uh, among young people to live and work in rural areas. And that potentially rural areas, as I dig into some of the findings, they potentially offer some of the features of the dreams already, but we also have to question the dreams and ask ourselves, they, they maybe raise questions for wider rural sustainability that we, we can't, I suppose, work towards policy that, that, that implements all of these features. There are kind of contradictions in there as well. Um, so in terms of this recipe, the livelihood, the lifestyle and the accommodation, what are the key ingredients that emerged in terms of the results? Um, 
a diversity of jobs. We see kind of social care, uh, community work, science, engineering, um, as key professions there. The kind of top professions that emerged were the farmer and the teacher again, and perhaps more traditionally rural professions there, but there's a, a diversity of jobs there. And a key concern here was the availability of work. And would this job actually um, be available for me in a rural area? Or am I going to have to commute outside of the rural area if I decide to live there? Um, and also, again, jumping into this kind of resilience question, there's an argument that the rural economy needs to diversify um, and that perhaps this range of examples we have here doesn't represent a very diversified rural economy. Um, whereas kind of our, our cultural and creative sector where like there, these are elements that are in the dreams, but in terms of the, the dominant jobs, we see kind of maybe a more traditional rural economy there. So we're asking ourselves, is there is there some work to do in terms of the job, uh, the, the perception of what is a rural job? There's also a question of this job versus a livelihood. So very strong within um, the dreams was this idea of, we want to make a comfortable living. We don't want to be millionaires living in rural areas, but we need um, to make a living from our livelihood. And we also want to enjoy our work um, and have a rewarding job. So kind of key um, ideas there that are not something that's traditionally maybe uh, dealt with in rural policy. So it points to other areas um, uh, of need um, that need attention to realize the dreams. Um, in terms of the lifestyle results, very much rural kind of comes out as a place for family life. And again, this, I guess, represents a more traditional view of, of rural and um, also the work life balance strong and that people have time for hobbies, sport being kind of a very um, strong um, factor in the Irish re research, particularly tied to the GAA and also um, activities that are related to the nature of rural areas that uh, nature landscape related activities were strong. Um, housing, I suppose unsurprisingly, um, the dominant house type that we saw was the kind of one-off bungalow in the house in the countryside. But this isn't the only type of house that was um, represented in the dreams. Also, people want to do up derelict houses. There's a kind of a diversity there. But just to note, kind of this is the the dominant, I suppose, dream house, which again presents presents issues. Um, and challenges for policy that go well beyond um, the rural domain. Um, but also when you think about housing, it's not just about building and buying a house. It's also about housing for young people at different stages of life who maybe need to share houses to rent. So there can be, I suppose, an availability problem that, that is a crisis across Ireland at the moment. But these are all issues that are coming out in the dreams. And finally, in terms of the kind of community that these young people want to live in, again, kind of family friendly, safe, peaceful and quiet, maybe the, the traditional um, nostalgic view of rural and um, that there's community spirit and um, again, kind of the GAA coming out here as a key kind of driver of keeping communities together um, in rural areas, a key issue, access to services particularly things around kind of post offices, Garda stations, but public transport and transport generally a key issue for young people. The cost of getting a driver's license, running a car and um, particularly issues. But I guess these are kind of basic services. It's, it's not that these young people are looking for for services that maybe are very difficult to provide in rural areas. But again, I, I guess in terms of the rural and the social capital is perhaps something in terms of the GAA example that is strong and is maybe a strength of rural areas in helping to meet um, these dreams of young people. So just for the last few moments to kind of try to draw out some of the policy implications and just for these few moments I wanted to kind of draw on the economic side of the resilience question so I suppose the, the jobs question um, and just to make the point that I guess what what has come out in these youth stream futures is that it raises a lot of kind of recurring rural development issues. It's, there's nothing uh, surprising there. 
And when we come back to some of the, the theory that we've looked at and the ideas that are underpinning the ruralization project, this idea of kind of spiraling that Louise mentioned as well, that how can we deal with one issue while also helping deal with another? Um, so can we kind of tie the job opportunities to helping rural areas deal with the sustainability transition um, that, that we all face as a society? So just a few ideas here, here in terms of this kind of thinking around jobs and sustainability. Is there a need to focus on youth skills and careers? Um, do we need to better understand the actual opportunities available in rural areas and the future potential um, growth areas or areas of need, the green and circular economy, potentially that can be developed in rural areas for different kinds of rural jobs that match uh, the ambitions of young people? And also thinking even be beyond this and before this, do we need to expand the career horizons of, of young people that that rural places, they tend, perhaps the research is telling us not to be seen as places for innovation and, and entrepreneurship. And can this, can we tackle this at, at the, the level of young people that they can see, okay, maybe social entrepreneurship is a future for me and I can help my, my rural economy and develop a job for myself. Um, and again, this also creates a need for a more specialized labor force. So we need, we need young people maybe to leave and come back, that, that this kind of youth brain drain is not a permanent thing and that, that the skills that these new sectors potentially need are available in rural areas. Again, coming back to this kind of jobs and the service needs in rural areas, how innovation and entrepreneurship targeted at young people and in key particular sectors of need in rural areas, um, of need for us in wider society, um, like the sustainability transition, can focusing on areas like this European Green Deal and how we realise some of this, our social enterprises and um, developing rural transport, for example, can this be part of the solution as well? So finally, just to kind of also make the broader point that um, young people are not a homogenous group, I've pre presented quite a generalised picture here. And we can look at this information by the kind of male female respondents, gender and sexuality angle, the life stage at 25 year old dreams versus the 30 year old or, or beyond as they looked beyond these age groups. If they're a migrant, if, if they've lived abroad. So there's there's huge kind of differences in, in terms of the, the assessment that needs to happen locally to realize these dreams. Um, and also uh, potentially within research as well, two groups tend to be talked about this, the people who want to stay and the people who leave, but how to, to bring them back. So again, it's a youth are a diverse group. We have lots of information here on um, the potential dreams, but we do kind of potentially for policy need to take this a step further as well and locally tailor. So thank you very much. Very good, Ashling. Excellent. Some great ideas. We had some great um, ideas and thinking, I think, coming out of, I suppose, all the angles of the, the ruralization project. And I suppose we spent quite a lot of work in the early stages looking at developing that conceptual framework that has been spoken about, those ideas of resilience, generate uh, resilience capital frameworks and I suppose innovation are really what we have pinned a lot of our work on. And again, that youth kind of thinking that um, Ashling just spoke about really was hugely interesting for us and something that we definitely feel we can feed into policy. And as is the remote working that Louise talked about as well. So I'm not sure if there are any questions at this stage for Louise and Ashling. Some people oh. finding it quite interesting in the chat, but maybe if there's something mm -hmm. Shane wants to bring in there or if somebody um, wants to actually come in at this stage, we're happy enough for somebody to come in for a moment. Yeah, just compliments from William and he suggested that we should have a, a separate session on uh, remote working as time goes on. So we will look into that. Um, just, I suppose, Louise, in relation to the remote working, uh, was newcomers, new entrants bring a lot of benefits to the area? Uh, is there any research or work done on this project in relation to, um, you know, potentially the move to an area, but about socially integrating into the area? Um, 
almost to this stay in a silo in their own home and they don't integrate. Is, is that a problem? And I know you mentioned that there's soft skills needed. So does that what is that what that means to, to incorporate them, to make them feel welcome? Uh, they mightn't even want to incorporate. That's that could be the problem. So I'm just wondering. It's a about big that. issue, Shane. I mean, yeah. from rural studies perspective, you know, first of all, them coming in brings out this whole issue of gentrification in rural areas. That's one element, of course, that needs to be tackled. Then from a so embedding them socially, we need them to embed within the community to actually get those capitals so that we can have that spiraling effect. But then you have from the respondent's point of view, someone saying, unless you have children, how are you going to meet anyone? So having the local networking, like the, the swimming clubs in the sea or having the GAA club, they are really, as Ashley mentioned in the youth work, they are critical for ways into the community. And sometimes, as I said, at the end of mine, that's sometimes where you need to start with policies, building up the, that infrastructure within a community to ensure that we can get that social integration because you need that diversity, you need that cultural and social diversity within a community so you can get that generation of idea. We talk about innovation and it's not, we don't mean technical, we don't need you know, major IT, it's about generation of knowledge that can create new ideas, a spark. So we see it in the hubs all the time from the connected hubs from the Western Development Commission. Dingle has an amazing hub. They're all over the place where other enterprises are actually spark the demand for other uses and services. So it's critical and it's an area, Shane, you quite rightly point out, needs a little mm. bit of thought to ensure that we get that right. Thanks, Louise. And I suppose just adding, leading on from that, Ashling. Like, you know, anecdotally, we all know about the GA, especially for from rural Ireland. We, we all know about the, the way it draws you back and the love for it. But, um, you know, is that from your studies in relation to the fu rural futures and the attachment to place from the youth? Can that be seen elsewhere? Like, obviously, there's not the GA, but is there a, a similar sort of a draw uh, or is a sport or what has been seen across the EU um, other than our example of G the GA? Yeah, it's it's actually quite a distinctive part of the Irish findings. Mm. Um, and I think like it, it, in terms of the results, kind of sport will come out generally and just act, I can think active pursuits that I think young people are are generally, you know, quite active. Um, so it's it's the GAA gets mentioned specifically in relation to that. But in, I suppose, the other European countries, sport, I don't think was such a, a high a high factor in terms of the range of lifestyle factors that um would kind of attract and keep young people in rural areas. So I think it is a real distinct strength in the Irish context and something that does distinguish us. Um, so that's kind of the, the general picture there that that it does it does kind of it has a strong place in the Irish findings and you you do see sport not sitting at such a high level and whether that you know whether that's the GAA we kind of jump to that conclusion and there's I suppose strong uh, signals towards that mm -hmm. um, but yeah that's kind of the, the wider perspective it does seem it is quite distinctly Irish <laughs> so Okay, I think at this stage we might um, move on slightly. We just had some very broad, I suppose, thinkings in and around um, the policy environment in particularly and the way and the direction in which we feel, I suppose, that we should go as a result of the um, ruralization project. And I suppose listening to all of what we've come out of so far uh, and we are very conscious that we are at the final stages of the project and we are working at the moment on the work package seven the policy directions for the actual project but even in in what we've done already what is coming forward for us is this idea of as it has come across in many projects prior to us and in much re rural research this idea of diversity and this idea of diverse rural areas needing possibly specific kind of policies tailored for them. So this idea of placed based policy and local investment is really, really essential. And I think at the moment, and again, we can see this even within our own context in Ireland, this idea and thinking in and around 
the smart villages kind of areas is tailored very much at a local level. It's tailored very much at a bottom up kind of thinking that we really have built our rural development scenarios on. And this idea of placed based policy, local investment is really essential in and around this. You know, all of the funds that we have there for rural areas really need to be tailored by people from the bottom up via local investment. We, I suppose, the ruralization project was built very much on the methodologies of case study examples, what was successful, but also what was not successful. So we were very conscious of looking at what was not successful and pulling out those kind of thinkings. And within a policy context, we have to make sure that what is transferable should be used. We should never think within a rural development context that we continuously need to come up with something new. What works in some areas can work quite successfully, modified or changed within another. So the transferability of successful models on the ground really needs to be something that we consider quite well within a policy environment. Thinking in and around what Ashling was talking about and that youth element, ruralization really depends on young people. It depends on that circle of youth that circle of generational renewal, that circle of new entrance into rural areas. And I suppose rural policy proofing really is imperative within our policy environment. And I suppose wider national issues that are impacting young people in housing and in jobs. And as Ashling mentions, jobs and employment are hugely important to young people, but not just jobs per se, but quality jobs. And that becomes very, very, that was becoming very evident to us within particularly the dream futures for young people. They wanted jobs within rural areas, but they wanted quality jobs, jobs that actually match their qualifications, because we do have quite a high level of educated young people living in rural areas. And in doing this, in considering policy proofing for rural areas, considering the national issues, we really can create a spin-off benefit for rural areas, particularly if young people uh, allow themselves to consider a future within that rural area. And in doing that, I suppose we also allow young people to become part of the rural solution. You know, young entrepreneurs, innovative type of thinking really can be something that drives rural communities. So we must make sure that we allow the young people to become part of that. And we create the policy environment that allows them again to have that local investment for them that is really essential. Networks and resilience were key factors of what we found. And I suppose networks, I suppose, first of all, within a lot of the projects areas that we did, the organics, the, the farm partnerships, networks really became hugely important um, within a, a rural context. And this networking enhanced that resilience that Louise talked about, that resilience that we really made as part of the conceptual framework for ruralization, that idea of spiraling upwards, that idea, that idea of bouncing forward, not just bouncing back from issues that I suppose have affected rural areas, but bouncing forward. Let's improve the scenario much more so than just bringing ourselves back to where we were in the past. We need to bring ourselves forward. Again, in thinking about policy and rural, um, I, I suppose rural policy into the future, we really need to consider those rural newcomers. We need to consider new entrants. We need to consider con success, successors to farming and successors to the wider rural area and new entrants to the wider rural area. I suppose we're on that cusp of change again in rural areas where migration is a real part of our lives. It's a real part of our rural lives. And we really need to be able to see new entrants into rural areas as something that can be part of this ruralization process. These people really can, coming into rural areas, can bring new parts of rural innovation. They can bring new resilience to rural areas that we really need to consider. So I suppose having newcomers 
a new entrance to become part of the ruralization process is really what we need. Within that young people, we need to be able to make sure, and I've, I've heard this quite often within many, many forums, this idea of bringing young people back into rural areas. And that's exactly what we need to do. After they've had that experience abroad and they can bring something back to the rural area. Yes, indeed, we need to bring them back. But we also, as Ashling said, we need to consider the stayers as well. Those people who have stayed, those young people who have stayed in rural areas is absolutely essential. So I suppose that idea of resilience, that idea of capital frameworks, that idea of building social capital in rural areas can really enhance the environment for newcomers, new entrants and successors, again, within farming and within rural areas. And again, as I said, I suppose we are still on the cusp of looking at the policy environment um, within the ruralization project at the moment. That's our final leg of the project and we're still working quite a lot on that. And I suppose in saying that, if people have any ideas in and around what we have presented today, we're only delighted to spend a few minutes listening to some ideas before we do a final couple of presentations and a wrap up. So we'd be delighted if anybody wants to pop in at this stage. And uh, I suppose uh, if there is any questions that people want to ask. I see um, Katerina is here and yeah. again has been a wonderful person that we followed great results in in relation to succession right across Europe and who does some great work as well in Europe. So Katerina, I'm wow. delighted you've tuned in. Yeah, thank you very much, Maura. This has been absolutely fascinating and um, I hope that uh, we'll uh, be able to sort of I'm just uh, have some ideas how we can involve you in our seminars because it, it would be fantastic to to hear more about your work I just would like to ask about the sort of policy um, arena because that's something that I, I am also looking at uh, quite closely are you looking at sort of the, the wider policy prospect or sort of specifically on the uh, just the rural development policy side, uh, because obviously one links to another and with the, the social capital and, and uh, obviously the jobs and jobs prospects, there are interlinkages uh, between various different type of policies. So what would be maybe the kind of an, really the, the focus of, of the recommendations? Yeah, I suppose, again, um, at the focus for us at the moment really will be looking at generation renewal, seeing can we get that young element, that youth element into the policy directives, things that really mm -hmm. impact on policy directives. I think, again, succession and inheritance in relation to farming and agriculture and young people, quality jobs within rural areas. So I suppose no more than ever, um, the policy directives for us are going to cross many bounds of government policy. And I think that's why rural proofing, I suppose, is something that's quite important as well for us, that those areas that where our research should impact, of course, we're looking towards the rural policy directives that we have there at the moment, the CAP strategic plan that's there at the moment. But we're also looking, I suppose, within the Irish context, that there's a broader consideration about what works for rural and the rural policy directives, I suppose, coming very, very soon again, are, are going to be needed within an Irish context. So feeding into those, feeding in that element of generation renewal, feeding in that element of making sure that we think about newcomers in rural areas, we think about these new generations, let it be via um, remote working, let it be via organic farming or succession in farming, but making sure that our central focus is really those new generations that we need, I suppose, to either return to rural areas or stay in rural areas. So I might ask Ashling as well, or Louise or Anne to feed in there as well. You're more than welcome. Yeah, I think Maura, you covered it there. And I think it's still a question maybe we're asking ourselves as well as we kind of pull apart all the research and look at things like, you know, in, in the Youth Futures Transport, we did a little a workshop a couple of weeks ago and like transport policy just came out really strongly as something that, you know, is a key, it's a key barrier for young people. And um, we had been quite focused on CAP in terms of what we propose to do in ruralization. Um, and we're kind of looking at this on different levels as well. So we're going to have, I suppose, European wide recommendations that kind of speak to the CAP. 
um, and speak to different, you know, DG, Regio, you know, there's there's such a, we have work to do on this. And I think mapping, in some sense, the policy arena at our national and regional levels to the European level. So it's, um, it's a uh, lot of work to do, uh, but lots of results that we want to see um, working in the real world. I yeah. think one of the things as well for us is that's cross-cutting across all the areas we've been researching is this idea of governance. And even as we now work through our final package of work, WP7, where we're doing the policy development, there is an element of co-creation in that. And I saw there another comment Renee mentioned about, you know, getting that embedded at the local level. You see it at trying to get newcomers in. You can get so far, but unless you have everyone on board where you have autonomy, where you can make decisions, where there is a devolution of some kind of agency i think that's going to be critical if we're trying to create new pathways we use this resilience lens we can't continue in the same path dependency where policies are built on past historical legacies we actually need you know almost like a revolution of this we need systemic change in terms of how we develop and formulate policies so i think governance is cross-cutting and something that we have to deal with you know you can we can write a lovely policy document and it'll go on another shelf but to really make a difference we need to just catch the nettle as they say and try and just attack it at governance level yeah well, thank you very much that's, that's very thanks Katrina. Uh, thanks. absolutely you know there are all of those big kind of thinkings but i think across right across the divide of policy we need to make sure that we have those ideas as as ashling said let it be jobs let it be employment let it be housing you know housing really came forward as something that young people were really as we know ourselves considered there it really is a huge issue for them it's a very emotive issue for them yeah if they want to live in rural areas but also this idea of one-off housing seemed to come which i suppose clashes with our environmental thinking but yet it is a dream of young people so i suppose considering all of those is really what we we kind of need to go forward with so katrina thank you very much for that and and i suppose as we come maybe towards the end of the session and we're hoping maybe not to to go off time on this because we're we're in maybe a little bit longer than we normally are within the rural voices seminar series um but i think you know to finish off <laughs> I suppose, as Ashling said, we have a lot of work to do still in ruralization. But with that in mind, we're actually very fortunate and very lucky. We have two new projects to be funded come January for us in the University of Galway. And Anne, of course, in Chagas is coming in on one of these as well. So we've been very lucky. We've been pretty busy trying to get these over the line, but we've been very fortunate that we have gotten over the line with two new projects. So we're just gonna give you a very little bit of a taster in relation to two of these. And one of them, which I am absolutely delighted Shane is going to work on um, from January. So I'm gonna get Shane to present the first one of these um, straight away, the premier project. So Shane has a few slides on this to show us. Yeah, thanks, Mara. <clears throat> so you can all see that, Jess? Thanks, Jane. Yep. Um, yeah, th this starts in January. So uh, really, it's a, it's just a quick overview for now, but it's called uh, Premier and uh, it's preparing multi-actor projects in a co-creative way. Um, just to set the scene, uh, to give a little bit of context as to what it's about, um, you know, there's a lot of societal challenges uh, being addressed by the EU, uh, be it through the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork. But in order to, to you know, to mobilize this and make them successful, um, there needs to be innovative solutions. And that word innovation, it's used, you know, across, you know, many platforms. But in an agricultural context, there, there's this movement towards um, this multi-actor approach um, is the most promising instrument to uh, speed up innovation. Um, and what I mean by that is these, um, it's co-creation of innovation. So, you know, using complementary expertise, be it practicals, technical, organizational, scientific, amongst the key ACAS actors. And ACAS is a new key word in the next cap, agricultural knowledge and innovation systems. So all the, the key individuals essentially that are involved in, in the sector, uh, be it farmers, researchers, advisors, agribusinesses. So really using all their, using all their uh, uh, be it uh, practical knowledge, scientific knowledge, all to, towards the common good in a complementary manner. Um, and this importantly is throughout the project, not just at the end or not just in the middle when we need farmers to feed in, but even at the beginning. So uh, there's a real, um, 
uh, knowledge base there that we're, we're able to draw from. Um, that essentially, mm. we call it soil specific knowledge in some uh, academic literature, but really what the farmers know, their lifelong, lifelong uh, lessons. Uh, these are examples. Uh, when I'm talking about this, a lot of you, they may have heard about the EIP Agri Operational Groups, um, epitomize what this is about. So whilst this project is looking into this, the EIP Agri Operational Groups have essentially inspired them. So um, these are some of the projects around the country. Um, they, they range from agri-environmental to uh, farm health, safety and well-being, but all with policy research and practice working together towards the common good. Um, and the EIP Agri, just to, to kind of give a little bit of an overview without going into it too much, but it's essentially about locally led farmer-centered results-based schemes. And when the farmers are at the center of the project, they're a lot more inclined to trust these projects, to engage in these projects because they have been involved from the outset. They've brought in their ideas, they've given the project team an, an overview of the landscape, an overview of be it the wildlife, et cetera, in the area. And um, hopefully by doing this, you remove this silo mentality that has often existed, that this is not my job or you need to do this. We don't want to get involved in this. So essentially that's the, the grounding or the background behind Premier. And this project will be uh, looking at how we can even tailor it more uh, closely to, to co-create these projects. So uh, in relation to the EIP Agri Operational Groups, you'd look at current projects and future potential projects, bringing them together, discussing how the ideas work. Um, policymakers across different forums, be it EU, national or regional, um, and uh, even broader than that, um, national uh, contact points to strengthen this enabling environment. So enabling um, innovation and enabling knowledge exchange. So knowledge, knowledge transfer has been a big thing over the years, but there is an acknowledgement now that it's more about knowledge exchange. It's not this top down message always. It's a, it's an, it's a, a blend of both. So um, yeah, um, we are one of um, uh, 15 partners. Uh, in this project, excuse me, sorry, um, the University of Sustainable Development in Germany, their um, Department of Management and Nature Conservation are the coordinators, um, and we are one of the partners. In relation to our work in this, uh, we will lead the work package one, so the connection of the premier project. So we will ensure the communication, dissemination, and constant dialogue between everyone in the consortium. Uh, linking up the various actors, uh, and not just in Ireland, but across the EU member states. But as well as that, we, we lead that package, but we're actually involved in each and every one of the other work packages, which we will, uh, at, at a later stage, when things are up and running, we can explain in more detail. Um, but, um, you know, we are essentially enabling all these ACAS actors, farmers, researchers, scientific advisors, uh, practitioners, um, to participate in these multi-actor projects and um, to exploit the project outputs uh, towards uh, successful implementation. You know, we are, uh, Amara and I are, I suppose we already are working in this space uh, with the National Rural Network Project. We have been engaging with different um, actors involved in, in the farm realm and the agricultural realm um, from across different forums. Um, so I suppose we, 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 are, we have a decent starting point in relation to this. This is just one example of a, a guest blog segment we had over the past few years and we compiled it into a booklet that you can check out. Also, uh, you know, we've been very cognizant that whatever we've published uh, from an academic perspective has always trickled down through the different forums. And, and as I always say, it's not about dumbing it down. It's essentially about getting the message out to, to, to the people that matter most. And that's hard to do when it's published in academic, uh, um, you know, peer reviewed process, um, papers that people have to pay for to read them. And then you have to, we essentially try and distill it down. And thankfully, we've had great context in the national and local media that have got the message out there. And ironically, policy reach out to you once it hits the newspapers. We found that. So this is a, a, a shameless plug for a EIP Agri National Conference, but it's on on the 28th of November um, in Athlone. So all them 57 Irish EIP multi-actor projects, um, I suppose the founding uh, foundations of uh, of this multi-actor approach um, moving forward will be will be uh, showcased on the day. So thanks for your attention. That was a rapid fire uh, overview of a project that hasn't even started. It's a, it's a five year project, excuse me, and it's five million. So it's, it's quite a substantial project. So hopefully we can uh, make a difference and uh, stimulate uh, 
multi actor thoughts. Great stuff, Shane. Thanks a million. Yeah, we're, we're absolutely delighted to be. Um, I might get you to stop sharing, Shane, and I'll mm -hmm. just share the next one. Yeah, we're delighted to be involved in that. Again, um, plenty more um, ideas and work for us to generate in Galway, but we're absolutely delighted to be involved in it. And very quickly, I suppose, I'm just going to give you a couple of slides in relation to another project that um, we are involved in again in Galway. And actually, this is one that we're leading um, so uh, the other project that Shane just mentioned, we are a partner in that project with the German University being the main partner and the lead partner. But the Falara project we are actually leading in, in Galway. So it's the Falara stands for female led innovation in agriculture and in rural areas. So this project, um, there was a call that came out before Christmas. Um, uh, 2021, uh, it was called a communities call, and it looked for um, ideas, projects in and around boosting innovation in farming and in rural areas that would be led by women. So it's very much an uh, horizon research and innovation actions project. And we were absolutely delighted to put a team together and we put 15 partners together. We are spanning across 10 countries. It's a three year project and it's worth three million. So again, uh, again, delighted to have Ashling involved, Louise, Shane, Mary Mahan in, in the department as well, John McDonough in the department and Trace Conway, all of from our own geography department in the University of Galway. But as you can see, we've also got Chagas there as a partner. So Anne is going to stay with us on this uh, as long as she's not sick of us from premier project or from the from the ruralization project we're delighted to have her again on this project uh, again um really the project itself focuses over the last number of years we've seen ourselves through our own work that there's a real need to make sure that we can bring forward the ideas that women are generating on the ground there are key trends key I suppose, aspects, challenges that we have in rural areas. And in order to overcome those challenges that we've talked about via ruralization, we really need everybody on board. We don't just need, I suppose, the key players that we've seen in the past in rural areas. We need everybody on board. And in order to have everybody on board, we also need to strongly connect with this gender aspect that is having and we need to grasp the opportunities and we need to make sure that in the past, women in particular in rural areas have been overshadows they've often been surpassed in relation to the ideas that they are generating so the falara project really it's a transdisciplinary project we're going to have many many disciplines coming in on this we're going to have academic partners non-academic partners but we really will be combining all of these people to make sure that we work with women on the ground to see what aspects they are covering, to see what kind of areas that it, they are excelling in on the ground, let that be digital, let that be ecological transitions, let that be any kind of impacts that women are having on the ground and we will bring them forward via the Falara project. So the idea in the project is to combine the futures and case studies methods. So we're really going to, again, Ashling talked about this idea of foresight approaches that we used in ruralization. We're going to use this methodology again in the Falara project, and we're going to maybe take this foresight approach and it will identify the vision for sustainable farm and rural futures and the sustainable innovations that are needed and how women can fit into that area. We're also going to create a community of practice right across Europe. And this will be developed with women that have been identified through our case study model and maybe identifying these women and then bringing them into a network where they can transfer the practices in that they are performing at, I suppose, at a ground level, and then maybe bringing these forward to um, policy innovations and governance. And again, I suppose underpinning all of that will be a conceptual framework that we will identify in the early stages of the Falara project. Again, some key ideas that we're going to bring forward is this community of practice network. We're going to try and create a campaign of visibility for women, for rural innovators, for spotlighting women as, I suppose, innovative actors. And we're also, I suppose, the outcomes of the project really will be to include maybe policy proposals, practical tools that can support women-led innovations. So that's just one um, additional piece of research that we have coming out 
of the University of Galway in conjunction with all of the other partners that we have in, uh, involved, and as well as the Premier Project. So I suppose if there's any questions that anybody wants us to ask us about the Ruralisation Project, or even the two new projects that we have coming out, um, we'd be delighted to answer them. And we are right on time, which is also great, but we would take a question if anybody wants to ask a question at this stage. But I also already see people kind of coming in saying that they're really happy that we have gender innovative um, research coming on board, which um, we are delighted about as well. It's a drum that we've been banging for quite a while in the University in Galway. So we're only delighted to kind of really focus on rural areas in relation to gender innovation. So I suppose on that sense, and again, thank you very much for um, people that are sending in messages there on the chat, but I think um, to keep on the ethos of the Rural Voices Project and not to go over time, I think um, we will call uh, an end to the presentation. I sincerely want to thank, um, first of all, um, Anne Kinsella, who has joined us from Chagas, who is part of our Ruralization Project and part of our Falara Project into the future, into the three years that we'll have that project. So thanks to Anne, um, but sincere thanks, I suppose, to the team of people that are involved in the ruralization project, um, Ashling and Louise, who worked directly on it, Shane, who has helped us along the road of ruralization right from the word go of the project, John McDonough, Mary Mahan, and Trace Conway in the background to consistently also provide us with advice and their extensive knowledge of rural, um, regeneration and rural development. Uh, again, I suppose uh, I want to thank the Department of Rural and Community Development as far as the Rural Voices is concerned and for always, I suppose, supporting a lot of the work that we do in rural development. But um, lastly, and most definitely, I want to thank all of you for joining us. You have been a fantastic audience and people who we really consider uh, being part of this rural journey that we're on um, in, in Galway, in the University of Galway, in Chagas, and all of the other people who have joined us today. So um, thank you most sincerely, and I hope you've enjoyed the presentation via the Rural Voices series. So Gormila Magat, and thanks for now. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you.